Chapter Five, Part One of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Five: The Man Who Squealed, Part One. Back in the early days, the payroll of the Hill Division was full of J. Smiths, T. Browns, and H. Something or Others, just as it is today. But today there is a difference. The years have brought a certain amount of inevitable pedigree, as it were, a certain amount of gossip, so to speak, over the back fences of Big Cloud. It's natural enough there's a possibility as a precedent that one or two of the passengers on the Mayflower didn't have as much blue blood when they started on the voyage as their descendants have got now. It's possible. The old hooker, from all accounts, had a pretty full passenger list, and there may have been some who secured accommodations with few questions asked, and a subsequent coat of glorified whitewash that they couldn't have got if they'd stayed at home, where they were intimately known. That is, they couldn't have got the coat of glorified whitewash. It's true that there is a few years between the landing of the Mayflower and the inception of Big Cloud, but the interval doesn't count. The principle is the same. Out in the mountains on the Hill Division, who's who begins with the founding of Big Cloud. It is verbose, unprofitable, and extremely bad taste to go back any further than that, even if it were possible. There's quite a bit known about the J. Smiths, the T. Browns, and the H. Something or Others now, with the enlightenment of years upon them, but there wasn't then. There were a good many men who immigrated west to help build the road through the Rockies and run it afterwards for reasons of their own. There weren't any questions asked. Plain J. Smith, T. Brown, or H. something or other went. That was all there was to it. He said his name was Walton, P. Walton. He was tall, hollow-cheeked, with skin of an unhealthy, colorless white, and black eyes under thin black brows that were unnaturally bright. He dropped off at Big Cloud one afternoon, in the early days, from number one, the limited from the east, climbed upstairs in the station to the super's room, and coughed out a request to Carleton for a job. Carleton, Royal Carleton, the squarest man that ever held down a divisional swivel chair, looked P. Walton over for a moment before he spoke. P. Walton didn't size up much like a day's work any way you looked at him. "'What can you do?' inquired Carleton. "'Anything,' said P. Walton, and coughed. Carleton reached for his pipe and struck a match. "'If you could,' said he, sucking at the amber mouthpiece between words, "'there wouldn't be any trouble about it. For instance, the construction gangs want men to I'll go. I'll do anything,' cut in P. Walton eagerly. Just give me a chance. Nope, said Carleton with a grin. I'm not hankering to break the Sixth Commandment. Know what that is? P. Walton licked dry lips with the tip of his tongue. Murder, said he. But you might as well let it come that way as any other. I'm pretty bad here. He jerked his thumb toward his lungs. And I'm broke here. He turned an empty trousers pocket inside out. Hmm observed Carleton reflectively. There was something in the other that touched his sympathy, and something apart from that that appealed to him, a sort of grim philosophical grit in the man with the infected lungs. I came out, said P. Walton, looking through the window and kind of talking to himself, because I thought it would be healthier for me out here than back east. I dare say, said Carleton kindly, but not if you start in by swinging a pick. Maybe we can find something else for you to do. Never done any railroading. Walton shook his head. No, he answered. I've always worked on books. I'm called pretty good at figures, if you've got anything in that line. Clerk, mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, said Carleton slowly. I guess perhaps we can give you a chance. My own clerk's doing double shift just at present. You might help him out temporarily. "'And if you're what you say you are, we'll find something better for you before the summer's over. Thirty dollars a month. It's not much of a stake. What do you say? It's a pretty big stake for me,' said P. Walton, and his face lighted up as he turned it upon Carleton. "'All right,' said Carleton. 
You'd better spend the rest of the afternoon, then, in hunting up some place to live. And here. He dug into his pocket and handed P. Walton two five-dollar gold pieces. This may come in handy till you're on your feet. Say, said P. Walton, huskily, I... He stopped suddenly as the door opened and Regan, the master mechanic, came in. Never mind, smiled Carleton. Report to Halstead in the next room tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. P. Walton hesitated, as though to complete his interrupted sentence, and then, with an uncertain look at Regan, turned and walked quietly from the room. Regan wheeled around and stared after the retreating figure. When the door had closed, he looked inquiringly at Carleton. "'Touched you for a loan, eh?' he volunteered quizzically. "'No,' said Carleton, still smiling. "'A job. And I gave him the money as an advance.' "'More fool you!' said the blunt little master mechanic. "'Your security's bad. He'll never live long enough to earn it. What sort of a job?' "'Helping Halstead out to begin with,' replied Carleton. "Hm," remarked Regan. "'Poor devil.' "'Yes, Tommy,' said Carleton. "'Quite so. Poor devil.' Regan, big-hearted, good-natured for all his bluntness, walked to the front window and watched P. Walton's figure disappear slowly and a little haltingly down the platform. The fat little master mechanic's face puckered. "'We get some queer cards out here,' he said. "'He looks as though he'd had a pretty hard time of it. Kind of a discard in the game, I guess. Out here to die. Pleasant, what? I wonder where he came from.' "'He didn't say,' said Carleton dryly. "'No,' said Regan. "'I dare say he didn't. None of them do. I wonder, though, where he came from.' And in this the division generally were in accord with Regan. They didn't ask, which was outside the ethics, and P. Walton didn't say, which was quite within his rights. But for all that the division with Regan wondered. Ordinarily they wouldn't have paid much attention to a new man one way or the other, but P. Walton was a little more than just a new man. He was a man they couldn't size up. That was the trouble. It didn't matter who anyone was or where he came from if they could form an opinion of him, which wasn't hard to form in most instances, that would at all satisfactorily fill the bill. But P. Walton didn't bear the earmarks of a hard case wanted east or show any tendency toward deep theological thought. Therefore, opinions were conflicting, which wasn't satisfying. Not that P. Walton refused to mix or held himself aloof or anything of that kind. On the contrary, all hands came to know him pretty well, as P. Walton. As a matter of cold fact, they had more chances of knowing him than they had of knowing most newcomers. And that bothered them a little, because somehow they didn't seem to make anything out of their opportunities. As assistant clerk to the super... P. Walton was soon a familiar enough figure in the yards, the roundhouse, and the shops, and genial enough, and pleasant enough, too. But they never got past the pure, soft-spoken, perfect English, and the kind of firm, determined swing to the jaw that no amount of emaciation could eliminate. They agreed only on one thing, on the question of therapeutics. They were unanimous on that point with Regan. P. Walton, whatever else he was or wasn't, was out there to die. And it kind of looked to them as though P. Walton had through rights to the terminal and not much of any limit to speak of on his permit. Regan put the matter up to Carlton one day in the super's office about a month after P. Walton's advent to Big Cloud. I said he was a queer card the first minute I clapped eyes on him, observed the master mechanic, and I think so now, only more so. What in blazes does a white man want to go and live in a two-room pigsty with a family of Polacks and about eighteen kids for? Carlton tamped down the dottle in his pipe with his forefinger, musingly. How much a week, Tommy? he inquired. He's thirty dollars a month, with about a third of the time out for six spells. Oh, I'm not a mathematician, growled the little master mechanic. About five dollars, I guess. It's a good guess said Carleton quietly. He bought new clothes, you remember, with the ten I gave him, and he needed them badly enough. Carleton reached into a drawer of his desk and handed Regan an envelope that was torn open across the end. 
"'I found this here this afternoon after the pay-car left,' he said. Regan peered into the envelope, then extracted two five-dollar gold pieces and a note. He unfolded the note and read the two lines written in a hand that looked like a steel plate engraving. With thanks and grateful appreciation, P. Walton. Regan blinked, handed the money, note, and envelope back to Carleton, and fumbled a little awkwardly with his watch-chain. "'He's the best hand with figures, and his pen it's ever been my luck to meet,' said Carleton, kind of speculatively. "'Better than Halstead, whole lot better. Halstead's going back east in a couple of weeks into the general office. Got the offer, and I couldn't stand in his way. I was thinking of giving P. Walton the job and breaking some young fellow in to relay him when he's sick. What do you think about it, Tommy?' "'I think,' said Regan softly. He's been getting blame few eggs and less fresh air than he ought to have had, trying to make good on that loan. And I think he's a better man than I thought he was. A fellow that would do that is white enough not to fall very far off the right away. I guess you won't make any mistake as far as trusting him goes. No, said Carleton, I don't think I will. And therein Carleton and Regan were both right and wrong. P. Walton wasn't... But just a minute. We're overrunning our holding orders. P. Walton is in the block ahead. The month hadn't helped P. Walton much physically, even if it had helped him more than he perhaps realized in Carleton's estimation. And the afternoon following Regan's and Carleton's conversation, alone in the room, for Halstead was out, he was hanging over his desk a pretty sick man, though his pen moved steadily with the work before him, when the connecting door from the super's office opened and Bob Donkin, the dispatcher, came hurriedly in. "'Where's the super?' he asked quickly. "'I don't know,' said P. Walton. "'He went out in the yards with Regan half an hour ago. "'I guess he'll be back shortly. "'Well, you'd better try and find him and give him this. Forty-two will be along in twenty minutes.' Donkin slapped a tissue on the desk and hurried back to his key in the dispatcher's room. P. Walton picked up the tissue and read it. It was from the first station west on the line. Gopher Butte, 3.16 p.m. J. H. Carlton, Superintendent Hill Division. Number 42, held up by two train robbers three miles west of here, express messenger Nulty in game fight killed one and captured the other in the express car. Arrange for removal of body, and have sheriff on hand to take prisoner into custody on arrival in Big Cloud. Everything okay. McCurdy, conductor. P. Walton, with the telegram in his hand, rose from his chair and made for the hall through the super's room, reading it a second time as he went along. There had been some pretty valuable express stuff on the train, as he knew from the correspondence that had passed through his hands, and he smiled a little grimly. "'Well, they certainly missed a good one,' he muttered to himself. "'I think I'd rather be the dead one than the other. "'It'll go hard with him. Twenty years, I guess.' He stepped out into the hall to the head of the stairs and met Carleton coming up. Carleton, quick as a steel trap, getting the gist of the message in a glance, brushed by P. Walton, hurried along the wall to the dispatcher's room, and the next moment a wide-eyed call-boy was streaking uptown for the sheriff and breathlessly imparting the tale of the hold-up embellished with gory imagination to every one he met. By the time Forty-Two's whistle sounded down the gorge, there was a crowd on the platform bigger than a political convention, and P. Walton, by virtue of his official position, rather than from physical qualifications, together with his chief, Regan, the ticket agent, the baggage master, and Carruthers, the sheriff, were having a hard time of it to keep themselves from being shoved off on the tracks, let alone trying to keep a modest breadth of the platform clear. And when the train came to a stop with screeching brake shoes and the side door of the express car was shot back with a dramatic bang by someone inside, the crowd seemed to get all together beyond P. Walton's control and surged past him. As they handed out a hard-visaged, bullet-headed customer, whose arms were tightly lashed behind him, P. Walton was pretty well back by the ticket office window with the crowd between him and the center of attention. And P. Walton was holding his handkerchief to his lips, flecking the handkerchief with a spot or two of red, and coughing rather badly. Carleton found him there when the crowd trailing Carruthers and his prisoner uptown thinned out, 
and Carleton sent him home. P. Walton, however, did not go home, though he started in that direction. He followed in the rear of the crowd up to Carruthers' place, saw steel bracelets replace the cords around the captive's wrists, saw the captive's legs securely bound together and the captive chucked into Carruthers' back shed. This was in the early days, and Big Cloud hadn't yet risen to the dignity of a jail, with about as much formality as would be used in handling a sack of meal. After that, Carruthers barred the door by slamming the long, two-inch thick piece of timber that worked on a pivot in the center home into its iron rests with a flourish of finality, as though to indicate that the show was over, and the crowd dispersed, the men headed for the swinging doors of the blazing star, and the women for their own back fences. P. Walton, with a kind of grim smile on his lips, retraced his steps to the station, climbed the stairs, and started through the super's room to reach his own desk. Carleton removed his pipe from his mouth and stared angrily as the other came in. "'You blamed idiot!' he exploded. "'I thought I told you to go home!' "'I'm feeling better,' said P. Walton. "'I haven't got those night orders out yet for the roundhouse. There's three specials from the east tonight.' "'Well, Halstead can attend to them,' said Carleton, a kindliness creeping into the tones that he tried to make gruff. "'What are you trying to do? Commit suicide?' "'No,' said P. Walton, with a steady smile. "'Just my work. It was a little too violent exercise trying to hold the crowd, that was all. But I'm all right now.' "'You blamed idiot,' grunted Carleton again. "'No, I didn't you say so. I never thought of it, or I wouldn't have let—' "'It doesn't matter.' said P. Walton brightly. I'm all right now. And he passed on into his own room. When he left his desk again, it was ten minutes of six, and Carleton had already gone. P. Walton, with his neatly written order sheets, walked across the tracks to the roundhouse, handed them over to Clarahue, the night-turner who had just come in, and then hung around, toying in an apparently aimless fashion with the various tools on the workbenches till the whistle blew, while the fitters, wipers, and day-gang generally washed up. After that he plodded across the fields to the Polack quarters on the other side of the tracks from the town proper, stumbled into the filthy garlic-smelling interior of one of the shacks, and flung himself down on the bunk that was his bedroom. "'Lord!' he muttered. "'I'm pretty bad tonight.' Guess I'll have to postpone it. Might be as well, anyway. He lay there for an hour, his bright eyes fastened now on the dirty, squalling brood of children upon the floor, now on the heavy, slatternly figure of their mother, and now on the tin bowl of boiled sheep's head that awaited the arrival of Ivan Peloff, the master of the house, and then, with abhorrent disgust, he turned his eyes to the wall. "'Thank God I get into a decent place soon,' he mumbled once. "'It's the roughest month I ever spent. I'd rather be back where—' He uh, smiled sort of cryptically to himself. "'Where I came from.' A moment later he spoke again in a queer, kind of argumentative, kind of self-extenuating way in broken sentences. "'Maybe I put it on a little too thick, Borden here.' so as to stand in with Carleton and pay that ten back quick. But, my God, I was scared. I got to stand in with somebody or go to the wall. It was after seven when Ivan Peloff came, smelling strong of drink, and excitement heightened the flush upon his cheek. Hello, Mr. Walton, he bubbled out with earnest inebriety. We raise hell tonight, by and by. Get them goods by midnight. Ivan Peloff drew his fingers around his throat, and in lieu of English that came hard to him at any time, jerked his thumb dramatically up and down in the air. Who? inquired P. Walton, without much enthusiasm. Damn robber, him by train come in, explained Ivan Peloff laboriously. Oh? said P. Walton. Talking of stringing him up, is that it? Ivan Peloff nodded his head delightedly. P. Walton swung himself lazily from his bunk. Eat, invited Ivan Peloff, moving toward the table. No, said P. Walton, moving toward the door. I'm not hungry. I'm going out for some air. Ivan Peloff pulled two bottles of a deadly brand from under his coat and set them on the table. Me eat, he grinned. By and by, have drinks all around. 
he waved his hands as though to embrace the whole Polak quarter, then we come, raise hell, do him goods by midnight. P. Walton halted in the doorway. Who put you up to this, Pilaf? he inquired casually. Cowboys, grinned Pilaf, lunging at the sheep's head. Plenty drink, say, have fun. Cowboys, hmm? observed P. Walton. So they're in town, are they, and looking for fun. We fix him good by midnight, repeated Ivan Pailov, wagging his head, then with a sudden scowl. You not tell, huh, Mr. Walton? P. Walton smiled disinterestedly, but there wasn't any doubt in P. Walton's mind that devilment was in the wind. Big Cloud in the early days knew its full share of that. Ah, said P. Walton quietly as he went out. No, I won't tell. It's no business of mine, is it? It was fall and already dark. P. Walton made his way out of the Polak quarters, reached the tracks, crossed them, and then headed out through the fields to circle around the town to the upper end again, where it dwindled away from cross streets to the houses flanking on Main Street alone. I guess, he coughed and smiled, I won't postpone it till tomorrow night after all. It was a long walk for a man in P. Walton's condition, and it was a good half-hour before he finally stopped in the rear of Sheriff Carruthers' back shed and listened. There were no fences here, just a procession of buttes and knolls, merging the prairie country into the foothills proper of the Rockies. Neither was there any sound. P. Walton stifled a cough and slipped like a shadow through the darkness around to the front of the shed, shifted the wooden bar noiselessly on its pivot, opened the door, and as he stepped inside, closed it softly behind him. Butch, he whispered, a startled ejaculation and a quick movement of a man suddenly shifting his position on the floor answered him. Keep quiet, Butcher, it's all right, said P. Walton calmly, and stooping, guiding his knife blade by the sense of touch, cut away the rope from the other's ankles. He caught at the steel-linked wrists and helped the man to his feet. "'Come on,' he said. "'Slip around to the back of the shed. Talk later.' P. Walton pushed the door open, and the man he called the butcher, lurching a little unsteadily from cramped ankles, passed out. P. Walton carefully closed the door, coolly replaced the bar in position, and joined the other. "'Now run for it,' he said, and led the way straight from the town. For two hundred yards, perhaps a little more, they raced, and then P. Walton stumbled and went down. I'm, I'm not very well tonight, he gasped. This'll do. It's far enough. The butcher halted, gazed at the prostrate form. Say, call, what's your name? he demanded. I owe you something for this, and don't you forget it. P. Walton made no answer. His head was swimming. Lights were dancing before his eyes, and there was a premonitory weakness upon him whose issue he knew too well, unless he could fight it off. The butcher went down until his face was with an inch of P. Walton's. So help me, he informed the universe in unbounded amazement. It's the Duke! Sit down here opposite me and hold out your hands, directed P. Walton with an effort. We haven't got any time to waste. The butcher, heavy with wonderment, obeyed mechanically, and P. Walton drew a rat-tail file from his pocket. I saw you in the express car this afternoon, and I went to the roundhouse for this when I left the office, P. Walton said as he set to work on the steel links. But I was, uh, I was feeling kind of down and out, and was going to leave you till tomorrow night, only I heard they were going to lynch you at midnight. Lynch me, growled the butcher. What for? They don't lynch a fella cause he's nipped in a hold up. We didn't kill no one. Some of the cowboys are looking for amusement, said P. Walton monotonously. They've uh, distributed red eye among the Polacks for the purpose, I imagine, of putting the blame on the Polacks. I get you, snarled the butcher with an oath. At the Bar K Ranch. We took their payroll away from them two weeks ago. Lynching, huh? Well, some of them will dance on air for this themselves, blast them. Duke, you're white, and you always was. 
I thought me luck was out for keeps today when Spud... You saw Spud, didn't you? Yes, said P. Walton, filing steadily. Spud always had a soft spot in his heart, said the butcher, instead of drilling that devil Nolte when he had the chance. Nolte filled Spud full of holes, and we fluked up. You're getting a bit of my wrist, Duke, with that damn file. Well, as I said, I thought me luck was out for keeps, and you show up. Change. Who'd have thought of seeing the angel Duke, the prize penman, the gem of forgers? <laughs> How'd you make your getaway? You was in for twenty spaces, wasn't you? I think they wanted to save the expense of burying me, said P. Walton. The other wrist, Butch, I got a pardon. Well, what's the matter with you, Duke? inquired the butcher solicitously. Lungs, said P. Walton tersely. Bad. Hell, said Butcher earnestly. There was silence for a moment, save only for the rasping of the file, and then the Butcher spoke again. What's your lay down out here, Duke? he asked. Working for the railroad in the super's office, and keeping my mouth shut, said P. Walton. There's nothing in that, said the Butcher profoundly. Nothing to it. Not much, agreed P. Walton. Forty a month, and... Oh, well, forty a month. I'll fix that for you, Duke, said the butcher cheerily. You join the gang. There's the old crowd from Joliet up here in the mountains. We got a swell layout. There's Larry and Big Tom and Dago Pete. Spuds cashed in. And they'll stand on their heads and yell Salvation Army songs when they hear that the slickest of them all, <laughs> that's you, Duke, is buying a stack and setting in. No said P. Walton. No, Butch, I guess not. It's me for the forty per. Ah, ejaculated the butcher heavily. You don't mean to say you've turned parson, Duke. You wouldn't be letting me loose if you had. No, nothing like that, replied P. Walton. I'm sitting tight because I have to, until someone turns up and gives my record away, if I'm not dead first. I'm too sick, Butch, to be of any use to you. I couldn't stand the pace. Sure you could, said the butcher reassuringly. Anyway, I'm not for leaving a pal out in the cold, and... He stopped suddenly and leaned toward P. Walton. What was it you said you was doing in the office? he demanded excitedly. Assistant clerk to the superintendent, said P. Walton, and his file bit through the second link. You'll have to get the bracelets off your wrists when you get back to the boys. Your hands are free. Say, said Butcher breathlessly, it's a cinch. You see the letters and, and know what's going on pretty familiar like, don't you? Yes, said P. Walton. Well, say, can you beat it? Once more the Butcher invoked the universe. You're the inside man, see? Jeez, it's a cinch. We only knew there was Mazuma on the train today by a fluke, just Spud and me heard of it. Too late to plan anything fancy and get the rest of the gang. You see what happened. After this, we don't have to take no chances. You passes out the word when there's a good juicy lot of swag coming along, we does the rest, and you gets your share. Equal. And that ain't all. They'll be sending down east for the Pinkertons, if they ain't done it already, and we gives them the laugh. You tipping us off on the trains the dicks are riding on, and putting us wise to them generally, and say... The butcher's voice dropped suddenly to a low, sullen, angry growl. You give us delay, the first crack we make, when that low, left, snook-nosed Nolte's aboard. He goes out for Spud, and he goes out quick. He's fired a gun for the last time he'll ever fire one, see? P. Walton felt around on the ground, picked up the bit of chain he had filed from the handcuffs, and handed it with the file to Butcher. Put these in your pocket, Butch, he said, and throw them in the river where it's deep when you get a chance, especially the file. I guess from the way you put it, I could earn my stake with the gang. Didn't I tell you you could, the Butcher with a swift change of mood, grinned delightedly. Sure you can. Larry's an innocent-looking kid, and he's not known in the town. He'll float around and get the bulletins from you. You'll know ahead when there's anything good coming along, won't you? 
"'When it leaves the coast,' said P. Walton. Thirty-six hours, sometimes more.' "'And I thought me luck was out for keeps,' observed the butcher in an almost awestruck voice. "'Well, don't play it too hard by hanging around here until they get you again,' cautioned P. Walton dryly. "'The further you get away from Big Cloud in the next few hours, the better you'll like it tomorrow.' "'I'm off now,' announced the butcher, rising to his feet. "'Duke, you're white all the way through. Don't forget about Nolte. Blast him.' He wrung P. Walton's hand with emotion. "'So long, Duke.' "'So long, Butch,' said P. Walton. End of Chapter 5, Part 1「Chapter Five, Part Two of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Five: The Man Who Squealed, Part Two. P. Walton watched the butcher disappear in the darkness, then he began to retrace his steps toward the Polack quarters. His one thought now was to reach his bunk. He was sick, good and sick and those premonitory symptoms, if they had been arrested, were still with him. The day had been too much for him, the jostling on the platform, mostly when he had fought his way through the rear of the crowd for fear of unguarded recognition on the part of the butcher, then the walking he had done, and, lastly, that run from the sheriff's shed. P. Walton, with swimming head and choking lungs, reeled a little as he went along. It was farther, quite a lot farther, to go by the fields, and he was far enough down from Carruthers now, so that it would not make any difference anyhow, even if the butcher's escape had been discovered, which it hadn't. The town was too quiet for that. P. Walton headed into a cross street, staggered along it, reached the corner of Main Street, and, fainting, went suddenly down in a heap, as the hemorrhage caught him and the bright crimson ruby stained his lips. Coming up the street from a conference in the super's office, Nulty, the express messenger, big, brawny, hard-faced, thin-lipped, swung along, dragging fiercely at his pipe, scowling grimly as he reviewed the day's happenings. He passed a little knot of Polacks, quite obviously far gone in liquor, and almost fell over P. Walton's body. Oh, oh, said Nulty, what the deuce is this? He bent down for a look into the unconscious man's face. "'The super's clerk!' he exclaimed, and stared around for help. There was no one in sight, save the approaching Polacks, but one of these hurriedly, if unsteadily, lurched forward. "'Mr. Walton,' announced Ivan Peloff genially. "'Him be sick, yes?' "'Where's he live?' demanded Nolte, without waste of words. "'Him by me live,' said Ivan Peloff, tapping his chest proudly as he swayed upon his feet. He called to his companions and reached for P. Walton's legs. "'We uh, take him by us home.' "'Leave him alone,' said Nulty gruffly, as the interior of a Polack shanty pictured itself before his eyes. "'Him by me live,' repeated Ivan Peloff, still reaching doggedly, if uncertainly, for P. Walton's legs. "'Let him alone, I tell you, you drunken guinea!' roared Nulty suddenly, and his arm went out with a sweep that brushed Ivan Peloff back to an ultimate seat in the road three yards away. Without so much as a glance in the direction taken by the other, Nulty stepped up to the rest of the Polacks, stared into their faces, and selecting the one that appeared less drunk than the others, unceremoniously jerked the man by the collar into the foreground. "'You know me,' he snapped. "'I'm Nulty. Nulty! Say it!' Nulty, said the bewildered foreigner. Yes, said Nulty. Now you run for the doctor. And you run like hell. If he ain't at home, find him. Tell him to come to Nulty. Quick. Understand? The Polak nodded his head excitedly. Doctor! Nulty! He ejaculated brightly. Yes, said Nulty. Go on now. Run! And he gave the Polak an initial start with a vigorous push that nearly toppled the man forward on his nose. Nulty stooped down, picked up P. Walton in his arms as though the latter were a baby, and started toward his own home, a block away. "'My God,' he muttered, "'a railroad man down there in a state like this. He'd have a long chance, he would. <laughs> Poor devil. 
Guess he won't last out many more of these. Blast it all! Now if the wife was home, she'd know what to do. Blamed if I know. For all that, however, Nulty did pretty well. He put P. Walton to bed and started feeding him cracked ice even before the doctor came. After that, Nulty went on feeding cracked ice. Along toward midnight, Gleason, the yardmaster, burst hurriedly into the house. "'Say, Nulty, you there?' he bawled. "'That blasted train robber's got away, and oh!' He had stepped from the hall over the threshold of the bedroom door, only to halt abruptly as his eyes fell upon the bed. "'Anything I can do, Nulty?' he asked in a booming whisper that he tried to make soft. Nulty, sitting in a chair by the bed, shook his head, and Gleason tiptoed in squeaky boots out of the house. P. Walton, who had been lying with closed eyes, opened them and looked at Nulty. "'What did he say?' he inquired. "'Says the fellow we got today has got away,' said Nulty shortly. "'Shut up. The doctor says you are not to talk.' P. Walton's bright eyes made a circuit of the room, came back, and rested again on Nulty. "'Would you know him again, if you saw him?' he demanded. "'Would I know him?' exclaimed Nulty. "'It's not likely I wouldn't, is it? I was deadheading him down from Gopher Butte, wasn't I?' "'I think,' said P. Walton, slowly, "'if it were me, I'd be scared stiff that he got away. Afraid he'd be trying to revenge that other fellow, you know.' And, uh, you want to look out for him. I'll ask nothing better than to meet him again, said Nulty grimly. Now shut up. You're not to talk. P. Walton was pretty sick. Nulty sat up all that night with him, laid off from his run the next day, and sat up with P. Walton again the next night. Then, having sent for Mrs. Nulty, who was visiting relatives down the line, Mrs. Nulty took a hand in the nursing. Mrs. Nulty was a little, sweet-faced woman with gray Irish eyes and no style about her. Nulty's paycheck didn't reach that far. But she knew how to nurse, and if her hands were red and the knuckles a little swollen from the wash tub, she could use them with a touch that was full enough of tender sympathy to discount anything a manicure might have reason to find fault with on professional grounds. She didn't rate Nulty for turning her home into a hospital and crowding her train sheet of work, already pretty full, past all endurance. Mrs. Nulty, God bless her, wasn't that kind of a woman. She looked at her husband with a sort of happy pride in her eyes, looked at P. Walton and said, Poor man, as her eyes filled, and went to work. But for all of that, it was touch and go with P. Walton. P. Walton was a pretty sick man. It's queer the way trouble of that sort starts. Down and out one day with every signal and every block set dead against you, and the next day a clear track with rights through buttoned in your reefer, a wide-flung throttle and the sweep of the wind through the cab glass whipping your face till you could yell with the mad joy of living. It's queer. Five days saw P. Walton back at the office, as good, apparently, as ever he was, but Mrs. Nulty didn't stop nursing. Nulty came down sick in place of P. Walton and took to bed. To give her a chance to keep her hand in, Nulty said. Nulty came down, not from overdoing it on P. Walton's account. A few nights sitting up wasn't enough to lay a man like Nulty low. Nulty came down with a touch of just plain mountain fever. It wasn't anything serious or anything like that. But it put a stop order, temporarily at least, on the arrangements Nulty had cussed P. Walton into agreeing to. P. Walton was to come and board with the Nultys at the same figure he was paying Ivan Payloff until he got a raise and could pay more. And so, while Nulty was running hot and cold with mountain fever, P. Walton, with Mrs. Nulty in mind, kept his reservations on down in the Polak quarters until such time as Nulty should get better and went back to work at the office. On the first night of his convalescence, P. Walton had a visitor, in the person of Larry, the brains and leader of the gang. Larry did not come inside the shack. He waited outside in the dark until P. Walton went out to him. "'Hello, Duke,' said Larry. "'Tough luck, huh? Been sick. Gee, I'm glad to see you. 
all to the mustard again? Couldn't get into town before, but a fellow uptown said you'd been bad. Hello, Larry, returned P. Walton, and he shook the other's hand cordially. Glad to see you, too. Yes, I guess I'm all right. Till next time. Sure you are, said Larry heartily. Anything good doing? Well, said P. Walton, I don't know whether you'd call it good or not. But there was a new order went into effect yesterday to remain in force until further notice, owing to the heavy passenger traffic. They are taking the mail and express cars off the regular afternoon eastbound trains and running them as a through extra on fast time. They figure to land the mails east quicker and ease up on the equipment of the regular train so as to keep them a little nearer schedule. So now the express stuff comes along on extra number 34. Do spider cut at 8.17 p.m., which is her last stop before Big Cloud. Say, said Larry dubiously, ain't going to be possible to board a train like that casual-like, is it? Then brightening suddenly, but say, when you get to thinking about it, it don't size up so bad, neither. I got the lay, Duke. I got it for fair. Listen, instead of a trainload of passengers to handle there won't be no one after the ditching but what's left of the train crew and the mail clerks a couple of us can stand the stamp lickers up easy while the two others pinches the swag oh, we'll stop her all right we'll ditch the train see there's a peach of a place for it about seven miles up the line from here we tap the wires big tom some cheese at that and then cuts them as soon as we know the train has passed by her cut and is wafting its way toward us. Ha! <laughs> Say it's good, Duke. It's like a Christmas present. I was near forgetting the registered mail. P. Walton laughed and coughed. I guess it's all right, Larry, he said. According to a letter I saw in the office this afternoon, there's a big shipment of banknotes that some bank is remitting, and that will be on board night after next. Say that again, said Larry, sucking in his breath quickly. I ain't deaf, but I'd like to hear it just once more. I was a thinking, said P. Walton, more to himself than to his companion, that I'd like to get down to northern Australia, up Queensland way. I say it's good for what ails me. Bakes it out of one. Duke, said Larry, shoving out his hand, you can buy your ticket the day after the night after next. You'll get yours, and don't you forget it. I'll see to that. We'll move camp tomorrow down handy to the place I told you about and get things ready. And say, Duke, is that cuss Nulty on the new run? I don't know anything about Nulty, said P. Walton. Well, I hope he is, said Larry, with a fervent oath. We're going to cut the heart out of him for what he did to Spud. The butcher was for coming into town and putting a bullet through him anyway. But I'm not for throwing the game. It won't hurt Spud's memory any to wait a bit. And we won't lose any enthusiasm by the delay. You can bet your life on that. And now I guess I'll mosey along. The less I'm seen around here, the better. Well, so long, Duke. I got it straight, huh? Night after tomorrow, train passes Spider Cut 817. That right? 817, night after tomorrow, yes, said P. Walton. Good luck to you, Larry. Same to you, Duke, said Larry, and slipped away in the shadows. P. Walton went uptown to sit for an hour or two with Nolte, turnabout being no more than fair play. Also, on the following night, he did the same, and on this latter occasion he took the opportunity, when Mrs. Nolte wasn't around to hear and worry about it, to turn the conversation on the hold-up, after leading up to it casually, when you get out and back on your run again, Nulty, I'd keep a sharp lookout for that fellow whose pal you shot, he said. You can trust me for that, said Nulty anxiously. I'll bet he wouldn't get away a second time. Unless he saw you first, amended P. Walton evenly. There's probably more where those two came from. A gang of them, I dare say. They'll have it in for you, Nulty. Don't you worry none about me, said Nulty, and his jaw shot out. I'm able to take care of myself. Oh, well, said P. Walton. I'm just warning you, that's all. Anyway, there isn't any immediate need for worry. I guess you're safe enough, so long as you stay in bed. The next day P. Walton worked assiduously at the office. 
If excitement or nervousness in regard to the events of the night that was to come was in any wise his portion, he did not show it. There was not a quiver in the steel-plate hand in which he wrote the super's letters, not even an inadvertent blur on the tissue pages of the book in which he copied them. Only, perhaps, he worked a little more slowly. His work wasn't done when the shop whistle blew, and he came back to the office after supper. It was close on ten minutes after eight when he finally finished, and went into the dispatcher's room with a sheaf of official telegrams to go east during the night at odd moments when the wires were light. "'Here's the super's stuff,' he said, laying the papers on the dispatcher's desk. "'All right,' said Spence, who was sitting in on the early trick. "'How's P. Walton tonight?' "'Pretty fair,' said P. Walton, with a smile. "'How's everything moving?' "'Slick as clockwork,' Spence answered. "'Everything on the dot. I'll get some of that stuff off for you now.' "'Good,' said P. Walton, moving toward the door. "'Good night, Spence.' "'Night, old man,' rejoined Spence, and, picking up the first of the super's telegrams, began to rattle a call on his key like the tattoo of a snare drum. P. Walton, in possession of the information he sought, that extra thirty-four was on time, descended the stairs to the platform and started uptown. "'I think,' he mused as he went along, "'that about as good a place as any for me when this thing breaks will be sitting with Nolte.' P. Walton noticed the light burning in Nolte's bedroom window as he reached the house, and, it being a warm night, found the front door wide open. He stepped into the hall, and from there into the bedroom. Mrs. Nolte was sitting in a rocking chair beside the lamp, mending away busily at a pair of Nolte's overalls, but there wasn't anybody else in the room. "'Hello,' said P. Walton cheerily. "'Where's the sick man?' "'Why, didn't you know?' asked Mrs. Nolte a little anxiously, as she laid aside her work and rose from her chair. The express company sent word this morning that if he was able, they particularly wanted to have him make the run through the mountains tonight on extra number 34. I think it was some special shipment of money. He wasn't at all fit to go, and I tried to keep him home, but he wouldn't listen to me. He went up to Elk River this morning to meet 34 and to come back on it. I've been worrying about him all day. P. Walton's eyes rested on the anxious face of the little woman before him, dropped to the red, hard-working hands that played nervously with the corner of her apron, then traveled to Nulty's alarm clock that ticked raucously upon the table. It was 8.17. Walton smiled. Now, don't you worry, Mrs. Nulty he said reassuringly. A touch of mountain fever isn't anything one way or the other. Don't you worry. It'll be all right. I didn't know he was out, and I was going to sit with him for a little while. But what I really came for was to get him to lend me a revolver. There's a coyote haunting my end of the town that's kept me awake for the last two nights, and I'd like to even up the score. If Nolte hasn't taken the whole of his armament with him, perhaps you'll let me have one. Why, yes, of course said Mrs. Nolte readily. Uh, well, there, there's two in the top of the bureau drawer. Take whichever one you want. Thanks, said P. Walton, and stepped to the bureau. He took out a revolver, slipped it into his pocket, and turned toward the door. Now don't you worry, Mrs. Nolte, he said encouragingly, because there's nothing to worry about. Tell him I dropped in, will you? And thank you again for the revolver. Good night, Mrs. Nolte. P. Walton's eyes strayed to the clock as he left the room. It was 8.19. On the sidewalk he broke into a run, dashed around the corner, and sped with instantly protesting lungs down Main Street, making for the railroad yards. And as he ran, P. Walton did a sum in mental arithmetic while his breath came in gasps. If you remember Flanagan, you will remember that the distance from Spider Cut to Big Cloud was 21.7 miles. P. Walton figured it roughly twenty-two. Number thirty-four, on time, had already left Spider Cut at 8.17, and the wires were cut. Her running time for the twenty-two miles was twenty-nine minutes. She made Big Cloud at 8.46. Counting Larry's estimate of seven miles to be accurate, number thirty-four had fifteen miles to go from Spider Cut before they piled her in the ditch, and it would take her a little over nineteen minutes to do it. With two minutes already elapsed, three now, 
and allowing, by shaving it close, another five before he started, P. Walton found that he was left with eleven minutes in which to cover seven miles. It took P. Walton four of his five-minute allowance to reach the station platform, and here, for just an instant, he paused while his eyes swept the twinkling switch-lights in the yards. Then he raced along the length of the platform, jumped from the upper end to the ground, and lurching a little, up the main line track to where four shortened, unclassed little switching engine, the 229, was struggling heavily, and stealing a momentary rest after having sent a string of flats flying down a spur under the tender guidance of a brakeman or two. And as P. Walton ran, he reached into his pocket and drew out Nulty's revolver. There wasn't much light inside the cab, there was only the lamp over the gauges, but it was light enough to show P. Walton's glittering eyes, fever bright, the deadly white of his face, the deadly smile on his lips, and the deadly weapon in his hand as he sprang through the gangway. "'Get out!' panted P. Walton coldly. Neither Dalheen, the fireman, nor Mulligan, fat as a porpoise, on the right-hand side, stood upon the order of their going. Dalheen ducked and took a flying leap through the left-hand gangway, and Mulligan, with a sort of anxious gasp that seemed as though he wished to convey to P. Walton the fact that he was hurrying all he could, squeezed himself through the right-hand gangway and sat down on the ground. P. Walton pulled the throttle open with an unscientific jerk. With a kind of startled scream from the hissing steam, the sparks flying from madly racing drivers, as the wheel tires bit into the rails, the old 229, like a frightened thoroughbred at the vicious lash of a yokel driver, reared and plunged wildly forward. The sudden violent start from inertia pitched P. Walton off his feet, across the driver's seat, and smashed his head against the reversing lever that stood notched forward in the segment. He gained his feet again, and his head swimming a little from the blow, looked behind him. Yells were coming from half a dozen different directions. Forms, racing along with lanterns, bobbing up and down, were tearing madly for the upper end of the yard toward him. There was a blur of switch lights, red, white, purple, and green, then with a wicked lurch around a curve, darkness hid them, and the sweep of the wind, the roar of the pounding drivers, deadened all other sounds. P. Walton smiled. A strange, curious, wistful smile, and sat down in Mulligan's seat. His qualifications for a brotherhood card had been exhausted when he had pulled the throttle. Engine driving was not in P. Walton's line. P. Walton smiled at the air latch, the water glass, the gauges, and injectors, whose inner workings were mysteries to him, and clung to the window sill of the cab to keep his seat. He understood the throttle in a measure. He had ridden up and down the yards in the switchers once or twice during the month that was past. That was all. Quicker came the bark of the exhaust, quicker the speed. P. Walton's eyes were fixed through the cab glass ahead, following the headlight's glare that silvered now the rails, and now flung its beams athwart the stubble of a butte, as the 229 swung a curve. Around him, about him, was dizzy, lurching chaos, as, like some mad thing, the little switcher reeled drunkenly through the night, now losing her wheelbase with a sickening slew on the circling track, now finding it again with a staggering quiver as she struck the tangent once more. It was not scientific running. P. Walton never eased her, never helped her. P. Walton was not an engineer. He only knew that he must go fast to make the seven miles in eleven minutes, and he was going fast. And mocking every formula of dynamics, the little switcher, with no single trailing coach to steady it, swinging, swaying, rocking, held the rails. P. Walton's lips were still half-parted in their strange, curious smile. A deafening roar was in his ears, the pound of beating trucks on the fish plates, the creak and groan of axle play, the screech of crunching flanges, the whistling wind, the full-toned thunder now of the exhaust, and reverberating back and forth, flinging it from butte to butte, for miles around in the foothills, the still night woke into a thousand answering echoes. Meanwhile, back in Big Cloud, things were happening in the super's office. Spence, the dispatcher, interrupting Carlton and Regan at their nightly pedro, came hastily into the room. "'Something's wrong,' he said tersely. "'I can't get anything west of here, and—' He stopped suddenly as Mulligan, flabby white, came tumbling into the room. 
he's going off his trump screamed mulligan gone delirious or mad or what's the matter carleton was on his feet his words cold as ice here gasped the engineer look he dragged carleton to the side window and pointed up the track the two two nine sparks volleying skyward from her stack was just disappearing around the first bend that that's the two twenty nine he panted p walton's in her drove me and dalheen out of the cab with a revolver for an instant no more than a breathing space no one spoke then spence's voice with a queer sag in it broke the silence extra thirty four left spider cut eight minutes ago carleton master always of himself and master always of the situation spoke before the words were hardly out of the dispatcher's mouth order the wrecker out spence jump mulligan go down and help get the crew together and then as spence and mulligan hurried from the room carleton looked at the master mechanic well tommy what do you make of this he demanded grimly regan with thinned lips was pulling viciously at his mustache what do i make of it he growled a mail train in the ditch and nothing worth speaking of left of the two twenty nine that's what i make of it carleton shook his head doesn't it strike you as a rather remarkable coincidence that our wires should go out and p walton should go off his head with delirium at the same moment eh snapped regan sharply eh what do you mean mm, i don't mean anything carleton answered clipping off his words it's strange that's all i think we'll go up with a wrecker tommy yes said regan slowly puzzled then with a scowl and a tug at his moustache it does look queer queerer every minute blame queer i wonder who p walton is and where he came from anyhow you asked me that once before carleton threw back over his shoulder moving toward the door p walton never said and while regan still tugging at his moustache followed carleton down the stairs to the platform and ill-omened call-boys flew about the town for the wrecking crew and the ten eighteen big and capable snorting from a full head of steam backed the tool car a flat and the rumbling derrick from a spur to the main line p walton still sat smiling strangely clinging to the window-sill of the laboring two two nine staring out into the night through the cab glass ahead you see said p walton to himself as though summing up an argument dispassionately ditching a train travelling pretty near a mile a minute is apt to result in a few casualties and nulty might get hurt and if he didn't the first thing they'd do would be to pass him out for keeps anyway on spud's account they're not a very gentle lot i remember the night back at joliet that larry and the butcher walked out with the guard's clothes on after cracking the guard's skulls they're not a very gentle lot and i guess they've been to some trouble fixing up for tonight enough so's they won't feel pleasant at having it spoiled i guess p walton coughed i won't need any ticket for the heat of northern queensland i guess he ended gravely i guess i'm going to hell p walton put his head out through the window and listened and nodded his head sound carries a long way out here in the foothills he observed they ought to hear it on the mail train as soon as we get close and i guess we're close enough now to start it p walton got down and clutching at the cab frame for support lifted up the cover of the engineer's seat there was sure to be something there among the tools that would do p walton's hand came out with a heavy piece of cord he turned then pulled the whistle lever down tied it down and screaming now like a lost soul the two two nine reeled on through the night the minutes passed and then the pace began to slacken dalheen was always rated a good fireman and a wizard with the shovel but even dalheen had his limitations and p walton hadn't helped him out any the steam was dropping pretty fast as the two two nine started to climb a grade p walton stared anxiously about him it must be eleven minutes now since he had started from the big cloud yards but how far had he come was he going to stop too soon after all what was the matter p walton's eyes on the track ahead dilated suddenly and as suddenly he reached for the throttle and slammed it shut he was not going to stop too soon perhaps not soon enough 
Larry, the butcher, Big Tom, and Dago Pete had chosen their position well. A hundred yards ahead the headlight played on a dismantled roadbed and torn up rails, then shot off into nothingness over the embankment as the right-of-way swerved sharply to the right. They had left no single loophole for extra thirty-four, not even a fighting chance. The mail train would swing the curve and be into the muck before the men in her cab would be able to touch a lever. Screaming hoarsely, the 229 slowed, bumped her pony truck on the ties where there were no longer any rails, jarred, bounced, and thumped along another half-dozen yards, and brought up with a shock that sent P. Walton reeling back on the coal in the tender. A dark form, springing forward, bulked in the left-hand gangway, and P. Walton recognized the butcher. "'Keep out, Butch!' he coughed over the scream of the whistle, and the butcher, in his surprise, sort of sagged mechanically back to the ground. "'It's the Duke!' he yelled with a gasp, and then, as other forms joined him, he burst into a torrent of oaths. "'What the blazes are you doing?' he bawled. "'The train'll be along any minute. If you ain't queered it already, cut out that cursed whistle! Cut it out, you hear, or we'll come in there and do it for you in a way you won't like. Have you gone nutty?' "'Try it!' invited P. Walton, and coughed again. <laughs> "'You won't have far to come, but I'll drop you if you do. I've changed my mind. There isn't going to be any wreck tonight. You'd better, you'd better use what time is left in making your getaway.' "'So that's it, is it?' roared another voice. "'You dirty pup! You'd squeal on your pals, would you, you white-livered snitch, you! Well, take that!' There was a flash. A lane of light cut streaming through the darkness, and a bullet lodged with an angry spat on the coal behind P. Walton's head. Another and another followed. P. Walton smiled and flattened himself down on the coal. A form leaped for the gangway, and P. Walton fired. There was a yell of pain, and the man dropped back. Then P. Walton heard some of them running around behind the tender, and they came at him from both sides, firing at an angle through both gangways. Yells, oaths, revolver shots, and the screech of the whistle filled the air. And again P. Walton smiled. He was hit now, quite badly, somewhere in his side. His brain grew sick and giddy. He fired once, twice more unsteadily. Then the revolver slipped from his fingers. From somewhere came another whistle. They weren't firing at him any more. They were running away. And P. Walton tried to rise and pitched back unconscious. Nulty, the first man out from the mail train, found him there, and wondering, his face and set and grim, carried P. Walton to the express car. They made a mattress for him out of chair cushions and laid him on the floor. And there, a few minutes later, Regan and Carlton from the wrecker, after a look at the 229 and the wrecked track that spoke eloquently for itself, joined the group. Carlton knelt and looked at P. Walton, then looked into Nulty's face. Nulty, bending over P. Walton on the other side, shook his head. "'He's past all hope,' he said gruffly. P. Walton stirred, and his lips moved. He was talking to himself. "'If I were you, Nulty,' he murmured, and they stooped to catch the words. "'I'd look out for the... for, for the... The words trailed off into incoherency. Regan, tugging at his mustache, swallowed a lump in his throat and turned away his head. "'It's queer,' he muttered. "'How do you know? What? I wonder where he came from and who he was.' But P. Walton never said. P. Walton was dead. End of Chapter 5 Chapter Six, Part One of The Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Six, The Age Limit, Part One. As its scarred and battle torn colors are the glory of a regiment, brave testimony of hard fought fields where men were men, so too the Hill Division is its tradition. And there are names there, too, on the honor roll, not famous, not worldwide, not on every tongue, but names that in railroading will never die. 
The years have gone since men fought and conquered the sullen gray-walled Rockies and shackled them with steel and iron and laid their lives on the altar of one of the mightiest engineering triumphs the world has ever known. But the years have dimmed no memory, have only brought achievement into clearer focus and honor to its fullness where honor is due. They tell the stories of those days yet, as they always will tell them, at night in the roundhouse over the soft purr of steam, with the yellow flicker of the oil lamps on the group clustered around the pilot of a 1600-class mountain greyhound, and the telling is as though men stood erect, bareheaded, at salute, to the passing of the old guard. Heroes? They never called themselves that never thought of themselves in that way those old fellows who have left their stories their uniform was a suit of overalls their decorations the grime that came with the day's work just railroad men hard-tongued hard-fisted hard-faced rough without much polish perhaps as some rank polish with hearts that were right and big as a woman's that was all mccaffery dan mccaffery was one of these. This is old Dan McCaffery's story. McCaffery? Dan was an engineer, one of the old-timers, blue-eyed, thin, but you'd never get old Dan that way. He wouldn't look natural. You've got to put him in the cab of the 304, leaning out of the window, way out, thin as a bent toothpick, and pounding down the gorge and around into the straight, making for the big cloud yards, with a string of buff-colored coaches jouncing after him, and himself bouncing up and down in his seat like an animated piece of rubber. Nobody ever saw old Dan inside the cab, that is, all in. He always had his head out of the window, said he could see better, though the wind used to send the water trickling down from the old blue eyes, and generally there were two little white streaks on his cheeks, where no grime or coal dust ever got a chance at a stranglehold on the skin crevices. For the rest, what you could see sticking out of the cab over the whirling rod as he came down the straight was just a black, greasy, peaked cap surmounting a scanty fringe of gray hair and a wizened face with a round little knob in the center of it for a nose. But that isn't altogether old Dan McCaffrey either. There was Mrs. McCaffrey. Everybody liked Dan, with his smile and the cheery way he had of puckering up his lips sympathetically and pushing back his cap and scratching near his ear where the hair was, as he listened, maybe, to a hard luck story. Everybody liked Dan. But they swore by Mrs. McCaffrey. Leaving out the railroaders who worshipped her anyway, even the worst characters in Big Cloud— and there were some pretty bad ones in those early days. Hangers-on and touts for the gambling hells and dives used to speak of the little old lady in the lace cap with a sort of veneration. Lace cap? Yes, sounds queer, doesn't it? An engineer's wife keeping his shanty in a rough-and-ready, half-baked bit of an uncivilized town in the shadow of the Rockies, and a lace cap. Don't go together very often, that's a fact. But it is equally a fact that Mrs. McCaffrey wore a lace cap, and somehow none of the other women ever had a word to say about her being stuck up, either. There was something patrician about Mrs. McCaffrey, not the cold standoffish effect that's only make-believe, but the real thing. The Lord knows she had to work hard enough but you never saw her rinsing the wash-tub suds from her hands and coming to the door with her sleeves rolled up. Not at all. The last thing you'd ever think there was in that house was a wash-tub. Little lace cap over smoothly parted gray hair, little black dress with a little white frill around the throat, and just a glad look on her face whether she'd ever seen you before or not. That was Mrs. McCaffrey. As far back as anyone could remember, she had always looked like that, always a little old lady, never a young woman, although she and Dan had come there years before, even before the operating department had got the steel shaken down into anything that might with justice be called a permanent right of way. Perhaps it was the gray hair. Mrs. McCaffrey's hair had been gray then, 
when it ought to have been the glossy, luxuriant brown that the old-fashioned daguerreotype hanging in the shanty's combination dining and sitting room proclaimed that it once was. Big Cloud, of course, didn't call her patrician, because they didn't talk that way out there. They said there was some class to Mrs. McCaffery, and if their expression was inelegant, what they meant by it wasn't. Not that they ranked her any finer than Dan, for the last one of them ranked Dan as one of God's own noblemen. And there's nothing finer than that, only they figured, at least the women did, that back in the old country she'd been brought up to things that Dan McCaffery hadn't. Maybe that accounted for their sending young Dan east, and pinching themselves pretty near down to bedrock to give the boy an education and a start. Not that Mrs. McCaffery had any notions that railroading and overalls and dirt was plebeian and beneath her, far from it. She was proud of old Dan, proud of his work, proud of his record. She'd talk about Dan's engine to you by the hour, just as though it were alive, just as Dan would, and she would have hung chintz curtains on the cab windows and put flower pots on the running boards if they had let her. It wasn't that. Mrs. McCaffery wasn't that kind. Only there were limitations to a cab, and she didn't want the boy, he was the only one they had, to start out with limitations of any kind that would put a slow order on his reaching the goal her mother's heart dreamed of. What goal? Who knows? Mothers always dream of their boy's future in that gentle, loving, all-conquering, up-in-the-clouds kind of way, don't they? She wanted young Dan to do something, make a name for himself some day. And young Dan did. He handed a jolt to the theory of heredity that should, if it didn't, have sent the disciples of that creed to the mat for the full count. When he got through his education, he got into a bank and backed the brain development the old couple had scrimped to the bone to give him against the market, with five thousand dollars of the bank's money. Old Dan and Mrs. McCaffrey got him off, Mrs. McCaffrey with her sweet old face, and Dan with his grim old honesty. The bank didn't prosecute. The boy was drowned in a ferryboat accident the year after, and old Dan had been paying up ever since. He was always paying up. Five thousand dollars, even in installments for a whole lot of years, didn't leave much to come and go on from his monthly paycheck. He talked some of dropping the benefit orders he belonged to, and he belonged to most of them. But Mrs. McCaffrey talked him out of that on account of the insurance, she said. But uh, really because she knew that Dan and his lodge rooms and his regalias and his worshipful titles were just part and parcel of each other, and that he either was or was just going to be supreme, high, chief, illustrious, something or other, of every order in town. Besides, after all, it didn't cost much compared with the other, just meant pinching a tiny bit harder. And so they pinched. Old Dan and Mrs. McCaffrey didn't talk about their troubles. You'd never get the blues on their account, no matter how intimate you got with them. But everybody knew the story, of course, for everybody knows a thing like that, and everybody knew that dollars were scarce up at the McCaffrey's shanty, for, though they didn't know how much old Dan sent east each year, they knew it had to be a pretty big slice of what was coming to him to make much impression on that five thousand dollars at the other end. And they wondered, naturally enough, how the McCaffreys got along at all. But the McCaffreys got along, somehow, outwardly without a sign of the hurt that was deeper than a mere matter of dollars and cents, got along through the years, and Mrs. McCaffery got a little grayer, a little more gentle and patient and sweet-faced, and old Dan's hair narrowed to a fringe like a broken tonsure above his ears, and... But there's our clearance now, and we're off with a clean-swept track and the rights through into division. Dan was handling the cab end of one of the local passenger runs when things broke loose in the east, a flurry in Wall Street. But Wall Street was a long, long way from the Rockies, and though the papers were full of it, there didn't seem to be anything intimate enough in a battle of brokers and magnates, bitter, prolonged, and to the death though it might be, 
to stir up any excitement or enthusiasm on the Hill Division. The Hill Division, generally speaking, had about all it could do to mind its own affairs without bothering about those of others, for the Rockies, if conquered, took their subjection with bad grace and were always in an incipient state of insurrection that kept the operating, the motive power, and the maintenance of way departments close to the verge of nervous prostration without much let-up to speak of. But when the smoke cleared away down east, the Hill Division and Big Cloud forgot their bridge troubles and their washouts and their slides long enough to stick their tongues in their cheeks and look askance at each other. And Carleton, in his swivel chair, pulled on the amber mouthpiece of his briar and looked at Regan, who in turn pulled on his scraggly brown mustache and reached for his hip pocket and his plug. The system was under new control. "'Who's H. Harrington Campbell when he's at home?' sputtered Regan. "'Our new general manager, Tommy,' Carleton told him for the second time. Regan grunted. "'I ain't blind. I've read that much. Who is he? Hmm? Know him?' Carleton took the pipe from his mouth, a little seriously. "'It's the P.M. and K. crowd, Tommy. Makes quite an amalgamation, doesn't it? Direct Eastern Tidewater Connection, what?' They're a younger lot, pretty progressive, too, and sharp as they make them. I don't care a hoot who owns the stock, observed Regan, biting deeply at his blackstrap. It's the bucko with the overgrown name in the center that interests me. Who's he? Do you know him? Yes, said Carleton slowly. I know him. He got up suddenly and walked over to the window, looked out into the yards for a moment, then turned to face the master mechanic. I know him, and I know most of the others, and I'll say, between you and me, Tommy, that I'm blamed sorry they've got their fingers on the old road. They're a cold, money-grabbing crew, and Campbell's about as human as a snowman, only not so warm-blooded. I fancy you'll see some changes out here. We turned down an offer from the pen last week, said the fat little master mechanic reminiscently. Maybe I... Carlton laughed. He could afford to. There was hardly a road in the country that had made covetous offers for the services of the cool-eyed master of the Hill Division, who was the idol of his men down to the last car tink. No, I guess not, Tommy. Our heads are safe enough, I think. When I go, you go. And as the P.M. and K. have been after me before, I guess they'll let me alone now that I'm on their payroll. What kind of changes, then? inquired Regan gruffly. I don't know, said Carleton. I don't know, Tommy. New crowd, new ways. We'll see. And in time, Regan saw. Perhaps Regan himself, together with Riley, the trainmaster, were unwittingly the means of bringing it about a little sooner than it might otherwise have come. Perhaps not. Ultimately, it would have been all the same. Sentiment and H. Harrington Campbell were not on speaking terms. However, one way or the other, in results, it makes little difference. It was natural enough that about the first official act of the new directors should be a trip to look over the new property they had acquired, and if there was any resentment on the Hill Division at the change in ownership, there was no sign of it in Big Cloud when the word went out of what was coming. On the contrary, Everybody sort of figured to make a kind of holiday affair of it, for the special was to lay off there until afternoon to give the big fellows a chance to see the shops. Anyway, it was more or less mutually understood that they were to be given the best the Hill Division had to offer. Regan kept his pet flyer, the 1608, in the roundhouse and tinkered over her for two days, and sent for Dan McCaffrey. There had been a good deal of speculation amongst the engine crews as to who would get the run, and the men were hot for the honor. Regan squinted at old Dan and squinted at the 1608 on the pit beside him. "'How do you think she looks, Dan?' he inquired casually. The old engineer ran his eyes wistfully over the big racer, groomed to the minute, like the thoroughbred it was. "'She'll do you proud, Regan,' he said simply. And then Regan's fat little hand came down with a bang on the other's overall shoulder. That was Regan's way. "'And you too, Dan,' he grinned. "'I've got you slated for the run.' "'Me,' said McCaffrey, his wizened face lighting up. "'You, sure.' 
Regan's grin expanded. "'It's coming to you, ain't it? You're the senior engineer on the division, aren't you? Well, then, what's the matter with you? Riley's doing the same for Pete Chartrand. He's putting Pete in the aisles. What?' Old Dan looked at Regan, then at the 1608, and back at Regan again. Say, he said a little huskily, the missus will be pleased when I tell her. We was talking it over last night and, and hoping, uh, yeah, just hoping, mind you, that, that maybe. Well, go tell her then, said the little master mechanic, who didn't need any word picture to make him see Mrs. McCaffrey's face when she heard the news, and he gave the engineer a friendly push doorwards. Not a very big thing to pull the latch on the director's special? Nothing to make a fuss over? Well, no, perhaps not. Not unless you were a railroad man. It meant quite a bit to Dan McCaffrey, though, and quite a bit to Mrs. McCaffrey, because it was an honor coming to Dan, and it meant something to Regan, too. Call it a little thing. But little things count a whole lot, too, sometimes in this old world of ours, don't they? There had been a sort of little program mapped out. Regan, as naturally fell to his lot, being master mechanic, was to do the honors of the shops, and Carleton was to make the run up through the Rockies and over the division with the new directors. But at the last moment a telegram sent the superintendent flying east to a brother's sickbed, and the whole kit and caboodle of the honors, to his inward consternation and dismay, fell to Regan. Regan, however, did the best he could. He fished out the black Sunday suit he wore on the rare occasions when he had time to know one day of the week from the other, wriggled into a boiled shirt and a stiff collar that was yellow for want of daylight, and, nervous as a galvanic battery, was down on the platform an hour before the train was due. Also, by the time the train rolled in, Regan's handkerchief was wringing wet from the sweat he mopped off his forehead. But five minutes after that, the earnest little master mechanic, as he afterwards confided to Carleton, wouldn't have given a whoop for two trainloads of them, let alone the measly lot you could crowd into one private car. Somehow Regan had got it into his head that he was going on his mettle before a crowd of up-to-the-minute, way-up railroaders, but what he found there wasn't a practical railroad man amongst them, bar H. Harrington Campbell, to whom he promptly and wholeheartedly took a dislike. Regan experienced a sort of pity and contempt, which, if it passed over the nabob's heads without doing them any harm, had at least the effect of putting the fat little master mechanic almost superciliously at his ease. Inspect the shops? Not at all. They were out for a joyride across the continent, and the fun there was in it. How long we got here? Three hours? Wow! boomed a big fellow, stretching his arms lazily as he gazed about them. <laughs> Let's paint the town, boys! wheezed an asthmatic, bow-legged little man of fifty who sported an enormous gold watch-chain. "'Come on and look the natives over!' Regan, who had been a little hazy on the etiquette of chewing in select company, reached openly for his plug, and kind of squinted over it non-committingly as he bit in at H. Harrington Campbell, who stood beside him. Carleton had sized the new general manager up pretty well, cold as a snowman, and he looked it. H. Harrington Campbell was a spare-built man, with sharp, quick, black eyes, a face like a hawk, and lips so thin you wouldn't know he had any if one corner of his mouth hadn't been pried kind of open, so to speak, with the stub of a cigar. "'Go ahead and amuse yourself, boys,' H. Harrington Campbell talked out of the corner of his mouth where the cigar was. "'We pull out at uh, twelve-thirty sharp.' Then to Regan curtly, well, look, the equipment and shops over, Mr. Regan. Yes, uh, sure, agreed Regan, without much enthusiasm, and led the way across the tracks toward the roundhouse as a starting point for the inspection tour. The whole blamed thing was different from the way Regan had figured it out in his mind beforehand, but Regan set out to make himself agreeable, and H. Harrington Campbell listened. H. Harrington Campbell was the greatest listener Regan had ever met, and Regan froze, and then Regan thawed out again, but not on account of H. Harrington Campbell. Regan might have an unresponsive audience, but then Regan didn't require an audience at all to warm him up when it came to his roundhouse and his big mountain racers and the shops he lay awake at night planning and thinking about. 
Here and there H. Harrington Campbell shot out a question, crisp, incisive, unexpected, and lapsed into silence again. That was all. They inspected everything, everything there was to inspect. But when they got through, Regan had about as good an idea of what impression it had made on H. Harrington Campbell as he had when he started out, which is to say, none at all. The new general manager just listened. Regan had done all the talking. Not that H. Harrington Campbell sized up as a misfit. Not by any means. Far from it. Regan didn't make that mistake for a minute. He didn't need to be told that the other knew railroading from the ground up. He could feel it. But he didn't need to be told, either, that the other was more a high-geared efficiency machine than he was a man. He could feel that, too. One word of praise Regan wanted, not for himself, but for the things he loved and worked over, and into which he put his soul. And the one word, where a thousand were due, Regan did not get. The new general manager had the emotional instincts of a wooden Indian. Regan, toward the end of the morning, got to talking a little less himself, that is, aloud. Inwardly, he grew more eloquent than ever, cholerically so. It was train time when they had finished, and the 1608, with old Dan McCaffery, half out of the cab window as usual, had just backed down and coupled on the special, as Regan and the new general manager came along the platform from the upper freight sheds and Regan, for all his inward spleen, couldn't help it as they reached the big powerful racer, spick and span from the guard plates up. "'I don't know where you'll beat that, east or west,' said Regan proudly, with a wave of his hand at the 1608. "'Wish we had more of that type out here. We could use them. What do you think of her, Mr. Campbell, hmm? H. Harrington Campbell didn't appear to take any notice of the masterpiece of machine design to speak of. His eyes traveled over the engine and fixed on Dan McCaffery in the cab window. Dan had an old but spotless suit of overalls on, spotless because Mrs. McCaffery, who was even then modestly sharing her husband's honors from the back of the crowd by the ticket office window, had made them spotless with a good many hours' work the day before, for grease sticks hard even in a wash tub, and on old Dan's wizened face was a genial smile that would have got an instant response from anybody except H. Harrington Campbell. H. Harrington Campbell didn't smile. Neither did he answer Regan's question. "'How old are you?' said he bluntly to Dan McCaffery. "'Me?' said old Dan, taken back for a moment. Then he laughed. "'Blessed if I know, sir. It's so long since I kept track of my birthdays. Sixty-one, I guess. No, no, sixty-two. H. Harrington Campbell didn't appear to hear the old engineer's answer any more than he had appeared to take any notice of the 1608. He had barely paused in his walk, and he was pulling out his watch now and looking at it as he continued along the platform, only to glance up again as Pete Chartrand, the senior conductor, gray-haired, gray-bearded, but dapper as you please in his blue uniform and brass buttons, hurried by toward the cab with the green tissue copy of the engineer's orders in his hand. Regan opened his mouth to say something, and instead snapped his jaws shut like a steel trap. The last little bit of enthusiasm had oozed out of the usually good-natured little master mechanic. Two days tinkering with the 1608, the division all keyed up to a smile, everybody trying to do his best to please, a dozen little intimate plans and arrangements talked over and worked out, were all now a matter of earnest and savage regret to Regan. "'By Christmas!' growled Regan to himself as he elbowed his way through the crowd on the platform, for the town, to the last squaw with a papoose strapped on her back, had turned out to see the director's special off. "'By Christmas! If twere not for Carlton's sake, I'd tell him the little tin god that he thinks he is, what I think of him, and maybe,' added Regan viciously, as he swung aboard the observation car behind H. Harrington Campbell, "'and maybe I will yet!' But Regan's cup, brimming as he held it to be, was not yet full. It was a pretty swell train, the director's special, that the crowd sent off with a burst of cheering that lasted until the markers were lost to view around a butte. A pretty swell train, about the swellest that had ever decorated the train sheet of the Hill Division. Two sleepers, a diner and observation, mostly mahogany, and the baggage car a good enough imitation to fit into the color scheme without outraging even the most aesthetic taste, and the 1608 on the front end, gold-leafed 
and shining like a mirror from polished steel and brass. As far as looks went, there wasn't a thing the matter with it. Not a thing. It would have pulled a grin of pride out of a Polak section hand, which is pulling some. And there wasn't anything the matter with the send-off, either. That was propitious enough to satisfy anybody. But for all that, barring the first hour or so out of Big Cloud, trouble and the director special that afternoon were as near akin as twin brothers. Nothing went right. Everything went wrong, except the 1608. That ran as smooth as a full jeweled watch, when old Dan, for the mix-up behind him, could run her at all. The coupling on the diner broke. That started it. When they got that fixed, something else happened. And then the forward truck of the baggage car developed a virulent attack of hot box. The special had the track swept for her clean to the western foothills and rights through. But she didn't need them. Her progress was a crawl. The directors, in spite of their dollar ante and the roof of the observation car for the limit, began to lose interest in their game. "'What is this new toy we've bought?' inquired one of them plaintively. "'A funeral procession?' Even H. Harrington Campbell began to show emotion. He shifted his cigar stub at intervals from one corner of his mouth to the other. Regan was hot, both ways, inside and out, hotter a whole lot than the hot box he took his coat off to, and helped old Pete Chartrand and the train crew slosh buckets of water over every time the director's special stopped, which was frequently. It wasn't old Pete's fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. It was just blamed hard luck, and it lasted through the whole blamed afternoon. And by the time they pulled into Elk River, where Regan had wired for another car and had transferred the baggage, the director's special, as far as temper went, was as touchy as a man with a bad case of gout. As they coupled on the new car, Regan spoke to old Dan in the cab. Spoke from his heart. We're two hours late, Dan. Hmm? For the love of Mike, let her out and do something. That bunch back there's getting so damn polite to me you'd think the words would melt in their mouths. What? Old Dan puckered his face into a reassuring smile under the peak of his greasy cap. "'I guess we're all right now we've got rid of that car,' he said. "'You leave it to me. I just leave it to me, Regan.' Pete Chartrand, savage as though the whole matter were a personal and direct affront, reached up with a new tissue to the cab window. Two hours and ten minutes late,' he snapped out. "'Nice, ain't it, director special. All the swells were doing ourselves proud. Oh, hell!' "'Keep your shirt on, Pete,' said Regan, somewhat inconsistently. "'Losing your hair over it won't do any good. You're not to blame, are you? Well, then, forget it. Two hours and ten minutes late. Bad enough, but in itself nothing disastrous. It wasn't the first time in railroading that schedules had gone a-glimmering. Only there was more to it than that.' There were not a few other trains, fast freights, passengers, locals, and work trains, whose movements and the movements of the director's special were intimately connected one with the other. Two hours and ten minutes was sufficient, a whole lot more than sufficient, to play havoc with a dispatcher's carefully planned meeting points over a hundred miles of right-of-way, and all afternoon Duncan had been chewing his lips over his train sheet back in the dispatcher's office at Big Cloud, until the director's special, officially Special 117, had become a nightmare to him. Orders, counter-orders, cancellations, new orders had followed each other all afternoon, and now a new batch went out as the rehabilitated Special went out of Elk River, and Bob Duncan, with a sigh of relief at the prospect of clear sailing ahead, pushed his hair out of his eyes and relaxed a little as he began to give back the completes. It wasn't Duncan's fault. There was never so much as a hint that it was. The day man at Mitre Peak forgot. That's all, but it's a hard word, the hardest there is in railroading. There was a lot of traffic moving that afternoon, and with sections, regulars, and extras all trying to dodge Special 117, they were crowding each other pretty hard, and the day man at Mitre Peak forgot. It was edging dusk as old Pete Chartrand from the Elk River platform lifted a finger to old Dan McCaffrey in the cab, 
and old Dan, with a sort of grim smile at the knowledge that the honor of the Hill Division, what there was left of it as far as Special 117 was concerned, was up to him, opened out the 1608 to take the rights they'd given him afresh for all there was in it. From Elk River to Mitre Peak, where the right-of-way crosses the divide, is a fairly stiff climb. From Mitre Peak to Eagle Pass at the canyon bed, it is an equally emphatic drop and the track in its gyrations around the base of the towering, jutting peaks, where it clings as a fly clings to a wall, is an endless succession of short tangents and shorter curves. The Rockies, as has been said, had been harnessed, but they had never been tamed, nor never will be. Silent, brooding always, there seems a sullen patience about them, as though they were waiting warily to strike. There are stretches, many of them, where no more than a hundred yards will blot utterly one train from the sight of another, where the thundering reverberations of the one, flung echoing back and forth from peak to peak, drown utterly the sounds of the other. And west of Mitre Peak it is like this, and the operator at Mitre Peak forgot the holding order for extra freight number 69. It came quick, quick as the winking of an eye, sudden as the crack of doom. Extra freight number 69 was running west, too, in the same direction as the director's special. Only extra number 69 was a heavy train, and she was feeling her way down the grade like a snail, while the director's special, with the spur and prod of her own delinquency and misbehavior, was hitting up the fastest clip that old Dan, who knew every inch of the road with his eyes shut, dared to give within the limits of safety on that particular piece of track. It came quick. Ten yards clear on the right away, then a gray wall of rock, a short, right-angled dive of the track around it, and as the pilot of the 1608 swung the curve, old Dan's heart for an instant stopped its beat. Three red lights focused themselves before his eyes, the tail lights on the caboose of extra number 69. There was a yell from little Billy Dawes, his fireman. My God, Dan, we're into her! Dawes yelled, we're into her! cool old veteran, one of the best that ever pulled a throttle in any cab. There was a queer smile on old Dan McCaffrey's lips. He needed no telling that disaster he could not avert, could only in a measure mitigate, perhaps, was upon them. But even as he checked, checked hard, and checked again, the thought of others was uppermost in his mind, the train crew of the freight, some of them anyway in the caboose. Dawes was beside him now, almost at his elbow, as nervy and as full of grit as the engineer he'd shoveled for for five years and thought more of than he did of any other man on earth. And for the fraction of a second, old Dan McCaffrey looked into the other's eyes. Give the boys in the caboose a chance for their lives, Billy, in case they ain't seen or heard us, he shouted in the fireman's ears. Hold that whistle lever down. Twenty yards, fifteen between them, the 1608 in the reverse, bucking like a maddened bronco, old Dan working with all the craft he knew at his levers, ten yards, and two men scurrying like rats from a sinking ship leaped from the tail of the caboose to the right away. Jump! The word came like a half-sob from old Dan. There was nothing more that any man could do, and he followed his fireman through the gangway. End of chapter 6, part 1